I want to talk to you about what President Obama's uh, latest speech was when he announced the, uh, the new budget and the uh, new uh, uh, trillion-dollar-plus budget. But b- let's go back to what Dave Ramsey said. You talk about people not really listening. Let's talk about the common man. You've got Dave Ramsey, who has the Christian audience uh, very dedicated to him, and he's coming out and saying that you are the Dr. Doomsday and that your book, Crash Proof, was really a doomsday uh, dissertation on what you're not supposed to do. He discussed, for example, with the caller that what would have to happen. Now, this was 2008, so we're talking about a very strong Dow, 12,000 plus. When that conversation was recorded, the Dow was over 13,000 when that radio show. But obviously, look, I listened to it at the time. And, you know, I heard about it because some people told me that Dave Ramsey had commented about me. And I actually reached out to Dave Ramsey's people after that was out to see if he wanted to have me on his program or to learn a little bit more about what I was saying and not just dismiss me as some kind of kook, which he did. And, of course, I got nowhere with Dave Ramsey's people. Now that it's 2010, it's two years after that interview, you can see how completely absurd uh, his statements were. That's the way the typical person thinks. I mean, he holds himself off to be an expert, but clearly that's not the case. I mean, first of all, you know, the person who called in, it was a, it was a woman whose father had read my book, Crash Proof, and after reading my book, he wanted to sell his stocks and buy gold. Now, that wasn't the only advice in my book. I had a chapter on gold. Now, at the time, I think gold was still under $800 an ounce, and the Dow was over 13000 Obviously, the Dow today is 10000 and gold is 1100 Clearly, he would have been much better off doing exactly what he wanted to do. But Dave Ramsey told his daughter that he would be an idiot to do that, that only idiots bought gold, that it was a stupid investment, and clearly he was wrong. Uh, she said that I, I said the stock market was going to crash. He said that it couldn't crash, that a stock market crash was impossible, because in order for the stock market to crash, he went off and enlisted about six different companies that would have to close their doors and go out of business. Now, you don't have to have companies going out of business for there to be a market crash, although a lot of major companies did go bankrupt in the collapse of 2008, and many more would have gone bankrupt had they not been bailed out. But if you just look at the six companies that Dave Ramsey mentions by name, Home Depot, Microsoft, Whirlpool, Ford, Alcoa, and GM, okay, Here's how much those six stocks dropped. Home Depot dropped 43%. Microsoft dropped 57%. Whirlpool dropped 78%. Ford dropped 85%. Alcoa dropped 85%. And General Motors dropped 99%. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a crash to me. Even though those companies didn't close their doors, the share prices collapsed. And, you know, so Dave Ramsey advised people not to sell these stocks. And, in fact, when he, would, he told the caller what he was doing with his own money, he said he was leaving it in the bank, earning interest, which is practically zero. But that was better than owning those stocks. But then he said he was keeping his money in fully paid for real estate, meaning real estate without a mortgage. Well, this was January of 2008. Real estate in most parts of the country is off by 30 to 50 percent since January of 2008. That's a huge loss. And in fact, the people who lost the most money were the people who bought their real estate the way Dave Ramsey's recommended it without a mortgage, because that's a real loss. I mean, if somebody bought a house with just 5% down or nothing down, they can walk away right now and they can stick the losses on the lender. But if you followed Ramsey's advice and you paid all cash or you made a very big down payment, you can't walk away. You're stuck with those losses. And, and so he just did not understand uh, the dynamics of the U.S. economy. He doesn't understand inflation or what creates it or where it comes from. He doesn't understand economics. He doesn't understand what drives economies to grow and prosper. He, he has a little bit of knowledge, just enough to make him dangerous to the extent that people think he knows what he's talking about and they follow his advice. He's really like the Pied Piper, uh, you know, leading, leading people off the edge of a financial cliff. Here's my take of all of this. You have individuals who do have an opportunity to listen to some different opinions, and it, there's nothing to say that Dave Ramsey at the time that he said it couldn't have been correct, but you're saying that you have a different view and that you need to, as an individual, listen to people that have a track record. And that's one thing I know that Ramsey always talks about is a track record. Now, here's, here's my question. On a macroeconomic level, I understand that you're very frustrated because you're not getting any attention or seemingly not getting the kind of attention you need from the Obama administration. You've decided to run for Senate. 
Now, from the standpoint of an individual living in Michigan, and they like what you're saying, we're, we're all about this type of uh, new mentality in Washington. What, first off, are your chances of winning the Senate seat? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I have to win the Republican nomination, and I'm running against two people. One of them is a career bureaucrat politician who was a, a, a representative for six years in Congress, and so he's running as a senator. And then I have another business person, Linda McMahon, who's very wealthy. Uh, you know, her and her husband are worth close to a billion dollars, and she's spending a tremendous amount of money trying to get elected. And then there's then me. So there's the three of us, and, and so I have to win the primary. So figure my chances of winning the primary. I mean, it's at least one out of three because there's three of us. But maybe it's, you know, I've got a 50-50 shot of winning the Republican primary. And then, you know, I've got to run and, and win in the general election. So I don't know, maybe if my odds are 50% there, so you, maybe I got a one in four chance of, of winning. I, you know, I don't know how to really handicap it, but I think it is a, a real possibility that I could be uh, the next senator from Connecticut. And I think that would be a major step in the right direction. Because right now, everything that's being done in the United States Senate is wrong. I mean, everything the government has done uh, in the aftermath of this crisis has simply set the stage for a bigger crisis. You know, they're making the same mistakes they made after the Nasdaq bubble burst. The government created the housing bubble. It was the result of their monetary policy and their regulatory policies. That's why we had it. It wasn't because of Wall Street greed. It was because of government incompetence uh, that this happened. And unfortunately, they're just as incompetent now, if, if not more so. The damage being done to the U.S. economy by current monetary policy and regulatory policy is even worse. The aftermath of it is going to be horrific uh, for, for most Americans, not only you know, in their general lives and their standards of living, but certainly for investors and savers and, and the implications for the value of what they saved or invested. Now, for the benefit of uh, a Detroit metropolitan area listener, I want to just kind of uh, paraphrase and correct me or tell me if I'm not correct, but I believe this is, is a fair statement. I've heard you say things like, to the common man, you are the answer. It's your drive. It's your competition, your fearlessness, your entrepreneurship that built this country and made it great. It's the everlasting character of America, which will rebuild it again. What do you say to a Detroiter? who's been decimated, an automotive engineer, 48 years old, specialized in automotive, uh, a CEO of a public relations company that relied on the automotive industry. What do you see for a Detroiter to look forward to? Yeah, I mean, we need you know, to bring back our automobile industry. We need a vibrant automobile industry in the United States. We need it desperately. But we're not going to get it back based on some kind of government initiative or government plan. Uh, we have to recreate the automobile industry the way we created it in the first place. You know, why was Detroit the automobile capital of the world? It was because we were the freest country in the world. It was because American entrepreneurs didn't have to pay a lot of taxes and comply with a lot of regulations. And so we were able to produce automobiles more efficiently than everybody else. And American entrepreneurs had access to capital because Americans had sound money. We had gold back money, we, and we had a reason to save. And people didn't have to pay so much in taxes, so they were able to save, which meant businesses had access to capital. They would, could make the investments, the long-term investments in plant and equipment that was necessary uh, to build things like automobiles. Because you need – it's very expensive. You, you know, to, if you want to make automobiles, you know, it's not like you know, opening up a, a, a store – you need machines. You need robots. You need, you need computers. You need a lot of expensive equipment to produce uh, automobiles and to do it efficiently. So we need to bring back our automobile industry, which means the government needs to get out of it, which means we should have let General Motors and Chrysler go bankrupt, not because you know, I don't want to make cars, but because I do. And I know that we're never going to make them profitably if the government's calling the shots. We need free markets. We need the equipment from General Motors to go up on the block so that somebody can buy those plants that can operate them profitably. We can't preserve these union contracts. They need to be destroyed in bankruptcy court. Uh, these companies need to be unencumbered by, by these debts and these, and these labor contracts that render it impossible for them to make competitive automobiles. Ultimately, if we do the right thing, uh, we can rebuild our industrial base, but it isn't going to be easy. And unfortunately, because it's been so decimated, uh, Americans are going to have to accept lower pay. I mean, that's the unfortunate consequence of what the government has done to our economy. By destroying our capital base, uh, you know, we're, we're in a deep hole. 
and we've got to basically start over again. 